painting is accessible to you anytime, any place, anywhere, and at any age. Hey guys, Erin here from the Artist Appeals and happy holidays. Yeah, we're coming on a new year here and I am excited for the new year. I don't know about you, but one of the things I do in the new year is I go through my books and take a look at what I want to read. I clean out a lot of old books that maybe I know I'm never going to get to. I try and pare down and focus on like what it is I want to do in the upcoming year. I pick out some books that I want to use to support those things. And um, this year, I wanted to support you guys with some of my favorite readings about art and painting and business. I've got a little shelf of them up there. I've shared some of my favorites in the past. And these are some that I pulled from off of my shelf upstairs. Let me just share them with you. This is the one I'm going to read to you from today. But we've also got upcoming The War of Art. Nice little play on words. You've heard of The Art of War, the famous, famous traditional one about war. Anyways, this one is the war of art about resistance. We'll take a look at that. Uh, in one of our upcoming episodes, we've got secret lives of great artists. This is a great one. I love the caricatures and sketches and the behind the scenes details they give. We got the power of center, which is a composition book. If you've never heard of it, I'm going to put that one on the shelf for reference. The inside the white cube. This is about the gallery spaces. Really fascinating philosophical read. I'm going to share with you ENSO this year. I did a project where I did three years of ENSO, coming back to myself and um, coming into needing just something simple and quick and accessible while having kids, and that was still meditative. So we're going to totally talk about that. And uh, Frames of Reference, this is a really fascinating art history book, totally different pedagogical approach or different take on a way to teach art history. So these are some of the ones that I pulled from my bookshelves upstairs that I want to add to my shelf over there. Um, but today I want to share this one with you because this is what I was reading last night. So I reread this the other last night and I hope to inspire some of you guys with some of the, the quotes out of this. So this is called Painting as a pastime. It's by Winston S. Churchill. He was the prime minister around World War II and um, really, really smart fellow. There's some really great quotes from him out there. Here he is at his easel painting. Yeah, that's right. Painting. This lovely, lovely little book is very old. You can see it's all yellowed and uh, been loved. It's a great book. If you can find one of these, you're fortunate. Let's see here. What was the publication date? Reprinted in 1965. Originally printed in 1950. Painting as a pastime. Many remedies are suggested for the avoidance of worry and mental overstrain by persons who, under prolonged periods, have to bear exceptional responsibilities and discharge duties upon a very large scale. In other words, there's lots of cures recommended for people with high stress jobs. Some advise exercise and other repose. Some counsel travel and others retreat. Some praise solitude and others gaiety. No doubt all these may play their part according to the individual temperament, but the element which is constant and common in all of them is change. Change is the master key. So if you're stressed out, doing something different is the key to not being stressed out. Let's see here. I'm going to skip forward a little bit. And he talks about um, using your mind and how it can get really worn down thinking about the same things, you know, being anxious about the same things. And if you just tell it to think about nothing and to stop, that, that doesn't work. Okay, so he goes on to say, a gifted American psychologist has said, worry is a spasm of the emotion. The mind catches hold of something and will not let it go. It is useless to argue with the mind in this condition. The stronger the will, the more futile the task. 
one can only gently insinuate something else into its convulsing grasp. And if this something else is rightly chosen, if it is really attended by the illumination of another field of interest, gradually and often quite swiftly, the old undue grip relaxes and the process of recuperation and repair begins. The cultivation of a hobby and new forms of interest is therefore a policy of first importance to a public man. So he's saying, if you're stressed out and you are thinking about the same things over and over and over again, a hobby is the cure. Then he goes on to say, to be really happy and really safe, one ought to have two or three hobbies, and they must all be real. It is no use starting late in life to say, I will take an interest in this or that. Such an attempt only aggravates the strain of mental effort. One man, a man, may acquire great knowledge of topics unconnected with his daily work and yet hardly get any benefit or relief. It is no use doing what you like. You've got to like what you do. Let me read that quote again, because I think it's really, really important. It's not just enough to like do whatever. You've got to really like what you're doing, your hobby, in order to get relief from the stress and the anxiety. So listen to this quote again. It's a really good one. It is no use doing what you like. You've got to like what you do. Broadly speaking, Human beings may be divided into three classes, those who are toiled to death, those who are worried to death, and those who are bored to death. It is no use offering the manual labor, tired out with a hard week's sweat and effort, the chance of playing a game of football or baseball on Saturday afternoon. It is no use inviting the politician or the professional man or businessman who's been working or worrying about serious things for five or six days to work on worry about trifling things at the week's end. As for the unfortunate people who can command everything they want, who can gratify every caprice and lay their hands on almost every object of desire, for them, a new pleasure, a new excitement is only an additional satiation. In vain, they rush frantically round from place to place, trying to escape from avenging boredom by mere clatter and motion. For them, discipline in one form or another is the most hopeful path. It may be said that rational, industrious, useful human beings are divided into two classes. First, those who work, whose work is work, and those whose pleasure is pleasure. And secondly, those whose work and pleasure are one. Let me read that quote again, because that comes to bear here in just a second, and I think is really, really smart. Human beings are divided into two classes. One, those whose work is work, and those whose pleasure is pleasure. And secondly, those whose work and pleasure are one. Don't we all desire to be that last one, that person whose work and pleasure are the same thing? Isn't it the ideal to love what you do, right? And the money will follow, isn't that what they say? So I think that's why a lot of us dream of being artists is because we find such pleasure in it. But Winston Churchill and this little poem gives us permission to just like art as a mental escape. He's talking about the flow state and about the pleasure you can get from creating art just to create art. So let me keep going. Of these, the former are the majority, those whose work is work and pleasure is pleasure. They have their compensations. The long hours in the office or the factory bring them as their reward, not only the means of substance, but a keen appetite for pleasure, even in its simplest and most modest forms. But fortune's favored children belong to the second class. Their life 
is a natural harmony. For them, the work hours are never long enough. Each day is a holiday, and ordinary holidays, when they come, are grudged as enforced interruptions in an absorbing vocation. So when you do what you love, that's that's the true thing we're all seeking, I think. Yet to both classes, the need of an alternative outlook, of a change of atmosphere, of a diversion of effort is essential. Indeed, it may well be that those who work, whose work is their pleasure are those who are, are most need of banishing it at intervals from their minds. Then he goes on to say one of the most common forms of diversion is reading and that reading is really awesome and that you should totally learn to read in another language and that even if you don't have time to read everything, you should take your books down and go through them, fondle them, reorganize them in a way that you like, right? So finally, he goes on to say that the really great relief from anxiety, from stress, from frustration is bum, 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 painting. So here we go. To restore psychic equilibrium, we should call into use those parts of the mind which direct both hand and eye, eye and hand. Many men have found great advantage in practicing handicraft for pleasure, joinery, chemistry, bookbinding, even bricklaying. If one were interested in them and skillful at them, would give a real relief to the overtired brain. But best of all and easiest to procure are sketching and painting in all their forms. I consider myself very lucky that late in life, I have been able to develop this new taste and pastime. Painting came to my rescue in a most trying time, and I shall venture in the pages that follow to express due gratitude, I feel. Quote, painting is a companion with whom one may hope to walk a great part of life's journey. Age cannot wither her, nor custom stale her infinite variety, he quotes. One by one, the more vigorous sports and exacting games fall away. Exceptional exertions are purchased only by more pronounced and more prolonged fatigue. Muscles may relax and feet and hands slow down. The nerve of youth and manhood may become less trusty. In other words, you can't do sports into your old age all the time, but painting you can always do. But painting is a friend who makes no undue demands, excites, excites to no exhausting pursuits, keeps faithful pace even with feeble steps, and holds her canvas as a screen between us and the envious eye of time or the surly advance of decrepitude. Happy are the painters, for they shall not be lonely. Light and color, peace and hope will keep them company to the end or almost to the end of the day. I love that. Painting is accessible to you anytime, any place, anywhere, and at any age. I'm going to skip forward a little bit here. I hope this is modest enough because there is no subject on which I feel more humble or yet at the same time more natural. I do not presume to explain how to paint, but only how to get enjoyment. Do not turn the superior eye of critical passivity upon these efforts. Don't be hard on yourself. If you wanna paint for fun, paint for fun. Don't judge yourself. I love that advice. and. We all need to hear it because I am totally hard on myself with my artwork. One of my goals this year is to show and sell more of my original artwork and to make that artwork available through licensing. So one of my big goals this year, one of my challenges that I'm going to do after having read this is to try and paint more for pleasure. So I've set myself a goal of painting 52 paintings over the course of the year. 
one per week at a minimum. So join along if you want to join me on this quest to paint every week for an entire year. Inspired by Winston Churchill and his painting as a pastime, this little book, it's really small. It's really great. He says that painting is such a pleasure and it really is. And he gives you permission to paint for fun. Let me read you just a few more of the quotes that I have underlined here. I like this one. The truth and beauty of line and form, which by the slightest touch or twist of the brush, a real artist imparts to every feature of his design, must be founded on long, hard, persevering apprenticeship and a practice so habitual that it has become instinctive. We must not be too ambitious. We cannot aspire to masterpieces. We may content ourselves with a joyride in a paint box. And for this, audacity is the only ticket. I like that. He says, don't try and be a master. Just be audacious and just have fun. So that's my inspiration for this year, to have fun painting, to bring it back to some fun. He has another fabulous quote about not being afraid of the white canvas. I don't know if you've ever been afraid of painting or you've stared at a white piece of paper and had writer's block or a white canvas and had painter's block. I love this quote. He was talking about how um, he, having bought a canvas and paints and easel, he was at um, a lovely place and he wanted to paint and he got it out and he, so very gingerly, I mixed a little blue paint on the palette with a very small brush and then with ink in a precaution made a mark about as big as a bean upon the affronted snow white shield. It was challenge, a deliberate challenge, but so subdued, so halting, indeed so catastrophic, catalytic. Ooh, that's a new word. That's a hard one. It was a challenge, a deliberate challenge, but so subdued, so halting. Indeed, so cataleptic that it deserved no response. At that moment, the loud approaching sound of a motor car was heard in the drive. From this chariot, there stepped swiftly and lightly none other than the gifted wife of Sir John Lavery. Painting! But what are you hesitating about? Let me have a brush, the big one. Splash into the turpentine, wallop into the blue and the white. Frantic, flourish on the palette. Clean no longer than several large, fierce strokes and slashes of blue on the absolutely cowering canvas. Anyone could see that it could not hit back. No ill fate avenged the jaunty violence. The canvas grinned in helplessness before me. The spell was broken. The sickly inhibitions rolled away. I seized the largest brush and fell upon my victim with berserk fury. I have never felt any awe of a canvas since. Winston Churchill, don't be afraid. Make big, bold moves and just go for it. A couple more quotes. I think this heightened sense of observation of nature is one of the chief delights that have come to me through trying to paint. Winston Churchill. And then another one. Obviously then, armed with a paint box, one cannot be bored. One cannot be left at a loose end. One cannot have several days on one's hands. Good gracious, what there is to admire and how little time there is to see it in. For the one first time one begins to envy Medusala, no doubt he made very indifferent use of his opportunities. Basically, in this lovely little quote, he talks about with art, you can never be bored. Obviously then, armed with a paint box, one cannot be bored. One cannot be left at a loose end. One cannot have several days on one hand. It's wonderful. He talks about so many wonderful things in this. And I think you're gonna really love this little book. Painting as a Pastime by Winston Churchill. Um, 
You know, you will never get to the end of this journey of art. But this, so far from discouraging, only adds to the joy and the glory of the climb. I think this is a wonderful and encouraging book. Check out. He says here on page 28 that art will make you observe nature even more, that it brings out the light and the colors and all the amazing things and the most commonplace objects. You would be astonished the first time you tried this painting to see how many and what beautiful colors there are even in the most commonplace objects. And the more carefully and frequently you look, the more variations do you perceive. But there are no reasons for limiting oneself to the plainest and most ordinary objects and scenes. Mere prettiness of scene, to be sure, is not needed for a beautiful picture. In fact, artificially made pretty places are very often a hindrance to a good picture. Nature will hardly stand a double process of beautification. One layer of idealism on top of another is too much of a good thing. But a vivid scene, a brilliant atmosphere, novel and charming lights, impressive contrasts, if they strike the eye all at once, arouse an interest and an adore, which will certainly be reflected in the work which you try to do and will make it seem easier. Go about and go out into the sunlight and be with happy with what you see. Another quote, this one about continuing what we talked about, about how um, artificially pretty places, you don't have to paint the prettiest of places. If something strikes you, if light strikes you, if contrast strikes you, if something strikes you about a scene, go ahead and paint it. Don't look for the prettiest place, the prettiest scene. You'll never be able to capture it. Just go with your gut, go with your heart. What is it that's speaking to you in this scenery, in this moment about this thing? And so he says, the painter must choose between a rapid impression, fresh and warm and living, but probably deserving only of a short life and the cold, profound, intense effort of memory, knowledge, and willpower, prolonged perhaps for weeks from which a masterpiece alone can result. It is much better not to fret too much about the latter. Leave to the masters of art, trained by a lifetime of devotion, the wonderful process of picture building and picture creation. Go out into the sunlight and be happy with what you see. Painting is complete as a distraction. I know of nothing which, without exhausting the body, more entirely absorbs the mind. Whatever the worries of the hour to flow along, there's no room for them in the mental screen. They pass out into shadow and darkness. All one's mental light, such as it is, becomes concentrated on the task. Time stands respectfully aside, and it is only after many hesitations that luncheon knocks gruffly at the door. So he says, don't worry about being a master of painting. Go outside and be a plein air painter. Enjoy painting for painting's sake. Enjoy the colors, the light, the contrast that you find outside. And he says that painting will take your mind off of things. It takes you into flow state. It takes you into that space where time stands respectfully aside, where time moves quickly. And it's as if no time has passed at all. And then all of a sudden, oh my gosh, it's lunchtime. That's what painting can do for you. Anyways, that's it for this Painting as a Pastime by Winston Churchill. I'll leave you with one more quote. Even if you cannot portray it as you see it, you feel it 
you know it, you admire it forever. Traveling and painting, plein air painting, going outside and capturing what you've experienced will solidify that moment, that memory, that experience in your mind. I find that when I create a piece of art, when I'm traveling or going somewhere, it really does that. It really slows you down. The painter wanders and loiters contentedly from place to place, always on the lookout for some brilliant butterfly of a picture, which can be caught and set up and carried safely home. A beautiful thought. So enjoy painting for painting's sake. You have permission from Winston Churchill himself. I hope you've enjoyed my little reading to you from um, my bookshelf, things that I'm reading. I hope that they'll inspire you to try it yourself and not get caught up in trying to be a master because that takes a lifetime. And so if you just take it one step at a time, do it over and over and over again. That's the surest way to gain mastery of anything is practice, right? Doing it again and again and again. But even if you just choose to enjoy painting for painting's sake, if you just choose to be a plein air painter and go outside and enjoy the day or use it for um, decreasing anxiety, frustration, stress, to get in flow state, Painting is a wonderful thing. Painting, drawing, and all of its forms is a wonderful thing. Thanks for joining me. I'm Erin here at The Artist Appeals, where we talk about the business of art. And today was an inspirational day. And uh, I'll be sharing more with you from my bookshelf. And I'll see you later. Look, 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 you guys. It's here. Oh, my God. You can get a printed version of The Artist Appeals on Amazon now. It looks so good. Oh, I'm so psyched. I like it in the paperback. The Artist Appeal. This is my first copy from Amazon.com. You can get your copy of The Artist Appeals, The Seven Steps for How to Make Money as an Artist, which summarizes some of the best stories, tips, tricks, lessons, um, quotes from the first two seasons of the podcast. Here it is, folks. I can't believe it. It's been a lot of work, guys. So there you have it. The printed version's out. Go get yours on Amazon.